Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. On a brief note of housekeeping, before we begin, a question and answer will follow the conversation, so please submit your questions at any time during the event using the question and answer feature at the bottom of the screen. Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia online. My name is Elizabeth Richard. I'm the daughter of late Barbara Gone Day, in whose memory this endowed lecture has been named. This evening's program is made possible through support from caring individuals like you, so please consider making a gift of whatever you are able to help the Free Library advance literacy, guide learning, and inspire curiosity for all Philadelphians. It's my sincere privilege to introduce Elizabeth Colbert for you this evening. She's been called an astute observer, excellent explainer, and superb synthesizer by the Seattle Times. Elizabeth Colbert is the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Sixth Extinction, An Unnatural History. An amalgam of field reporting, scientific discovery, and natural history, it follows the ongoing legacy of the man-made global cataclysm that threatens the very existence of life on Earth. A longtime staff writer at The New Yorker and a member of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists Science and Security Board, she's earned a Guggenheim Fellowship, two National Magazine Awards, and a Heinz Award, among other honors. In Under a White Sky, Colbert returns to her study of humanity's impact on the world to examine how we might change nature in order to save it. Her talk tonight will be a conversation with award-winning broadcaster and journalist, Tracy Matisak. We are so pleased to have you with us this evening. Elizabeth and Tracy, the screen is yours. Thank you. Well, Elizabeth Richard, thank you so much for the lovely introduction. And Elizabeth Colbert, welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. It's a delight to have an opportunity to speak with you again. Oh, well, thank you all very much. It's, it's, I'm sad that I can't be in Philadelphia with you all, but it's, it's a pleasure to virtually be with you. So Elizabeth Richard uh, just reminded us that we have budgeted some time toward the end of our conversation for audience Q&A. So uh, if you've got a question for Elizabeth, you'll want to look for that Q&A icon that will probably be at the bottom of your screen. Click on that and type in your question there, and then we'll get through as many of those as possible uh, toward the end of our time together. Uh, but all of that said, Elizabeth uh, Colbert, why don't we jump right into Under a White Sky. Um, you begin the book by asserting that the biblical instruction to uh, have dominion over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth uh, that humankind has taken that instruction to a very dangerous level, um, so much so that it's been said that we're living in a new age uh, called the Anthropocene. Can you talk about what that is and why does it matter? Sure. So, so the under you know the concept of the of the Anthropocene or Anthropocene, there's no sort of agreed upon uh, even pronunciation. The English and the Americans pronounce it differently, to be honest, um, is that humans have become really the dominant force on planet Earth, that we are our geological force. And the, and the person who really came up with this term and popularized the term was a Dutch scientist named Paul Crutzen, who just died last week. And he was one of the who's very most famous for having been one of the scientists who identified ozone depleting chemicals. So someone saw, someone tweeted, you know, people talk about, many people talk about saving the world and Paul Crutzen really did by alerting the world to the dangers of ozone chlorofluorocarbons and other ozone depleting chemicals uh, before it was too late. Um, and then he came up with this, this term uh, the Anthropocene and, and what he was referring to, and he, he, he told me once, I interviewed him once, and he said, I, I wanted the term to be a warning to the world that, that humans have become such a dominant force that we are now vying with you know, the great forces of nature. And, and when he wrote, he wrote a little piece for nature that, where he sort of summed up this concept and some of the ways in which we're altering the world on a geological scale that he pointed to were, we're changing the atmosphere. We've changed the composition of the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels, pouring a lot of CO2 into the air, changing the climate. Uh, we have changed, very, very radically altered the nitrogen cycle on earth because we 
produce a lot of nitrogen fertilizers in our fat in our you know fertilizer plants. Um, we have dammed or diverted most of the world's major rivers. So all of these have uh, are going to leave a mark. We we're, we're you know driving many many species extinct far far higher extinction rates than what are, is known as the background extinction rates. And all of these will leave a permanent geological marker. So if you're like a geologist, you know, many millions of years from now, you will be able to come back and say that something pretty unusual was going on right now uh, in what we, we consider to be right now. Yeah. And, and so the theme that runs through the book is that human beings have created all of these interventions to try to solve problems, but now those interventions have created a whole new set of problems that are now requiring a whole new set of interventions. Yes, exactly. And the book the book begins with, um, I think, a very vivid example of that, where uh, in the at the turn of the twentieth century, uh, the, the nineteenth to the twentieth century, Chicago was faced with a terrible problem. It was pouring all of its waste into the Chicago River, which ran east. Uh, through the city and east into Lake Michigan. And Chicago also um, drinks from Lake Michigan. So you were getting all of these outbreaks of waterborne disease. And it was said that the river was um, so thick with filth that a chicken could walk across it without getting her feet wet. And so it was decided that something had to be done about that. And, and what was done was this extraordinary construction project, one of the largest in the world for its day, which reversed the flow of the Chicago River. So the Chicago River now does not, no longer runs into Lake Michigan, it runs away from Lake Michigan and into the Mississippi system. But that had the unintended, so that was solving one problem, but it had the unintended side effect of connecting these two drainage basins, the Great Lakes drainage basin and the Mississippi drainage basin, which previously had been separate not by much, but separate enough so that if you were a fish, you know, you couldn't get across. And in the, at the turn of the 20th century, that became, it was evident that this was another big problem that had been created by joining these two systems. And so it was decided something needed to be done about that. And the something that was done about that was to electrify, believe it or not, a part of this water system. So that now if you're a fish and you're trying to cross from one basin to another, you get um, a pretty big voltage, you know, pretty a lot of volts through your body, and hopefully you decide to to swim away as opposed to crossing this electric barrier. And and that's that's sort of exhibit A in the book of this phenomenon. Yeah. Well, and you talk about the Asian carp, right? As as part of that, and and how you know so much of this is is interconnected, and just the the huge number of them and the problems that that has created. Yes, so, so Asian carp were, you know, interestingly and somewhat ironically brought to the US from Asia. Asian carp are often referred to as one species. There are actually four species that we're talking about. And they were brought to the US in the, in the 60s, different species to serve as agents of, of biocontrol. Um, and, and this was right after Rachel Carson had written, published Silent Spring, which was very, uh, really alerted America to the dangers of using a lot of chemicals, um, pesticides, and herbicides that were really, you know, killing not just, you know, pest species, but a lot of, there was a lot of bi-kill, as it were, um, and she really raised the alarm on that, and so people were looking for substitutes for those chemicals, and one idea uh, was, well, we'll use these biocontrol agents. We'll use one species against another species. So these carp were brought in to, for example, eat uh, aquatic weeds, try to help with some of the um, nutrient loading that goes on when, when sewage treatment plants are not fully, you know, getting, tr treating. This was, you know, right when the Clean Water Act was coming into effect. So they were brought in to serve as biocontrol agents, they very quickly got loose and are now wreaking havoc. They're, they're very large fish. They're very effective filter feeders. They eat everything in the water column. They've really taken over. There are parts of the Mississippi system where 
um, so over 75% of the biomass in the water now is Asian kelp. Wow. And, and from what I understand, Elizabeth, before we move on to a, a sort of a related issue, you don't want to get hit by one of them. And apparently that happened to you. Yeah. So when, so, so Asian carp are, you know, they're ecologically very, you know, destructive to systems where they're, you know, that they're not native to like the U.S. But what really, I, I think I say in the book, what really jumps out at people is that they jump. They, when they're disturbed, silver carp, one of these species, when it's disturbed, it, and, and it could be disturbed by a motor, um, it flings itself out of the water and you can go to my book or you can go online and find pictures of, you know, just these fish flying everywhere. And everyone I spoke to had been hit by an Asian carp, some to, you know, terrible effect. I myself was hit um, in the leg and it was quite painful, but, you know, nothing broken, nothing damaged. Yeah, wow. So not completely unrelated to that, um, you talk in that same section of the book about New Orleans. And I wanna read this uh, to make sure that I get the information right, but you're talking about the land loss in Louisiana. Um, and you said that since 1930, Louisiana has shrunk by more than 2000 square miles. Every 90 minutes, Louisiana loses the equivalent of a football field's worth of land. And the worst of it is happening in the parishes around New Orleans. Um, how have we as human beings contributed to such immense land loss there? Well, this is another case of, um, as you say, as you say, sort of an intervention that now requires new intervention. So the whole Mississippi Delta, all of Southern Louisiana was formed over many thousands of years by the Mississippi River, which carried, carried a lot of sediment continues to carry a lot of sediment, though not as much as it used to, um, because it's been so levied up. Uh, and every spring, basically, it would overflow its banks and dump this this sediment, this dirt, uh, clay, silt across the landscape. And this would build up year after year until eventually the river decided the the grade had gotten too steep, and the river would just switch course and start laying down another, they're called delta lobes, another bulge of land. And this just happened, kept happening. The river kept flipping around, kept building more land uh, for thousands of years. And then the French arrived in the uh, early part of the 18th centuries, and they founded New Orleans in 1718. New Orleans just celebrated its 300th anniversary. Um, and as soon as they founded the city, which was not much of a city in 1718, obviously, they decided, you know, with sort of that colonial mindset, uh, that they were not going to allow the river to, you know, push them around. They were going to keep the river in its place. And thus began this project of trying to control the Mississippi, a, which has been a 300 year project uh, and involves you know, billions and billions of dollars worth of waterworks, levees, flood walls, pumping stations, you know, an incredible uh, system of waterworks that protects the city of New Orleans, or at least usually protects it, has that, not always. Um, but the problem is, and you can sort of hear it in this description of how the land was created, once you stop creating land, the land starts to sink. And that's what's happening. And New Orleans is sinking very fast. And the parishes around it are sinking very fast, some of the fastest sinking places on earth. And without getting more of the sediment onto the landscape, they're just going to disappear. So now the proposal is, and the plan is, this is very much in the engineering phase and, and will be built um, to try to create what sort of controlled flooding to counteract the effects of flood control, these enormous um, they're called sediment diversions. They're basically just enormous construction projects which will direct uh, water out of the Mississippi when there's a very high flow and when the river's carrying a lot of sediment uh, onto this, these, into these sort of bays and hopefully over time build up land to try to protect, in part to try to build back these wetlands and in part to try to protect the city of New Orleans. So apart from that, is there a day coming where New Orleans would be underwater? 
Well, you know, New Orleans is at, at the front lines, as it were, because it's sinking, because it's, um, you know, it's it, much of New Orleans is below sea level. When you're in New Orleans, you know, you don't, you don't realize this, but then you walk up to the river, you know, anyone who's been to New Orleans, you, 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 you are literally walking up to the river. Um, so the combination of this very soggy delta soil that's compacting and sinking and sea level rise is a very dangerous combination. And so, you know, for example, after Katrina, the Army Corps of Engineers built up the city's levees again for once again for you know billions of dollars and and really tried to shore up this storm protection system, but everyone would acknowledge now that it's already you know sunk and no longer offers yeah. offers the level of protection that you'd want for a city of its size. So it's a very very serious problem. Um, will you know is New Orleans just going to get washed off the face of the earth? Um, Certainly, I think every effort will be made to, to prevent that from happening. Yeah. Interesting, though, that we're, you know, we're talking about in, in, in talking about the Asian carp issue and everything that has happened up around Chicago and then, you know, what's happening in New Orleans. I mean, we're talking about the Mississippi River, right, and, and these things happening and, and there is some relationship. We're talking about all of this happening in the same body of water in different locations. Um, you write also extensively about the pupfish at Devil's Hole, uh, possibly the rarest fish in the world. Fascinating chapter of the book. For those of us who have not been, can you tell us about where Devil's Hole is and what is it about these tiny little fish that makes them so special and that has caused scientists to put so much energy into trying to save them? Sure, so the, so the Devil's Hole pupfish, um, which as you say, Tracy, is is believed to be, and I, I'm not sure there's even any competition for it, uh, the rarest fish in the world is a very small, like one inch long, very beautiful little iridescent blue fish. And how it got into Devil's Hole is a, is I think I, I so one scientist describes it as like a beautiful enigma. Um, Devil's Hole itself is a, is a canyon, it's a little canyon. Uh, and at the bottom of it, is this pool of water and it's a beautiful blue pool of water and it's connected, the pool is connected to this huge underground aquifer. And if you dive down into the pool as, as the scientists regularly do, uh, we know that it's at least 500 feet deep. Um, no one unfortunately has ever touched bottom and, and lived to tell the story. There are, are literally bodies down there um, somewhere. Um, and the Devil's Hole pupfish lives only in Devil's Hole, only in this pool and really only in the top layers of this pool. Um, under extremely difficult conditions, the water is really warm. It's heated ge geothermally. It's a, sort of a constant 93 degrees Fahrenheit. So very warm, very low oxygen. Most fish could not survive there. But the Devil's Hole pupfish somehow got into this pool and can only survive under these really intensely harsh conditions. Hmm. And in the 60s, back in the 60s, people started pumping groundwater out of this aquifer and the level of the water started to fall and that caused the population to decline. And people have since the 60s been working and some of the things that were rigged up really are, you know, they're, they're comical, almost tragic comedy, you know, they put up lights in the canyon, they've fed the fish, they created fake habitat for them, you know, in the canyon um, to try to preserve them. And when things got really bad down to really a handful of fish, we're talking like a couple dozen fish, the forest, the fish and wildlife built the fish a fake canyon to have a backup population. So there's now a completely fake devil's hole about a mile from the real devil's hole. Wow. Um, I was curious, just as you were describing uh, scientists counting them periodically, and you mentioned that when you take all of them together, and I think at this point there were 190, and you said that they weigh less than a McDonald's filet fish sandwich, that's how tiny they are. How do they count these tiny fish? Well, they go down. I mean, it's it's something to watch. They they send down two um, 
divers, you know, scientists are certified as divers and it's, it's, um, it's supposed to be a very fascinating and fun thing to do. I'm not a diver, so, um, and I, but I watch them and they take a, a dive slate with them and the two of them go down through the water column and, you know, literally count the fish and they, they sort of back each other up. They try to get as close to, as they can to counting every one. Obviously it's pretty tough. They, and then they come back up and then they do it again to try to do uh, as accurate a survey as they can. Wow. Um, you write as well about the coral reefs and, and you write about Ruth Gates, um, who you spent a lot of time with. She was a marine biologist and there was a quote that really struck me. Uh, she said, our project is acknowledging that a future is coming where nature is no longer fully natural. I thought, you know, that's really, that's something that you need to let sink in. Yeah, so I mean, that that project that Ruth Gates was working on, which is a project that was nicknamed the Super Coral Project, that was really the, honestly, that was what set me off to write this book. It was the first um, trip I made chronologically, though it's in the middle of the book. And Ruth, who a, was a microbiologist and who very tragically passed away about two years ago, her idea, this, this super coral project, which as I say, is at the, at the heart of the book. The thought there, the idea behind it was, well, you know, we've, we've changed the oceans quite dramatically. We've, we've warmed up the oceans. That's a function of climate change. And we're also changing the chemistry of the oceans because when you pour a lot of CO2 into the water, it, into the air, a lot of it gets absorbed by the oceans and changes the pH of the oceans. So this is sort of a double whammy. And one group of organisms that really we know already doesn't like these conditions are reef building corals. So these tiny little animals, tiny little gelatinous animals that build these enormous structures that are reefs that are you know, really crucial habitat for many, many, many marine species, countless marine species. And so they don't like warm water temperatures and <clears throat> we've lost a lot of our coral reefs over the last 30 years or so. And Ruth's point was, well, if we want reefs in the future, we're not, you know, we're not getting that heat out of the ocean. We're not getting the chemistry of the oceans back in any foreseeable future. So we're gonna have to sort of try to manipulate corals to see if we can create corals that can survive climate change. And so these were sort of, this was sort of an effort to crossbreed, hybridize corals and maybe come up with some more resilient strains uh, of coral. Um, and that was, that was the idea behind the Super Coral Project, which continues, I should say, continues to this day. So this is the assisted evolution that you write about. Yes, exactly. They had sort of dubbed this process assisted evolution. And, you know, it's, it's a very daunting prospect to try to, you know, repopulate a reef, the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia, which is the world's largest reef, which isn't really, you know, one reef. It's really thousands of reefs, sort of in a in a system. Um, it's the size of Italy. So, you know, these interventions, um, the mind, you know, the mind sort of reels when you think about trying to intervene on that scale, and that's. You know, something that comes up, I think, in a lot of the chapters, scale is really a, a tremendous issue. Yeah. Elizabeth, one of the things that I so appreciated about your book was your humor, because these are, this is heavy subject matter. Um, when you talk about the, the immense problems that we have created, and now the interventions that we have to create to correct the problems that we caused, and yet um, you find ways to interject humor. And there was one passage in particular that I would love for you to read to us. I'd love to hear it in your voice, uh, talking about that sort of assisted evolution and your the opportunity that you had to witness coral sex. Can you read that passage for us? Sure, I will read this. I will give a, a little intro, which is that I was in, in Australia, not, not Hawaii for this part where this, so the project sort of spans Hawaii and Australia, and I had timed the visit to correspond uh, with coral sex. And I will, I will read your description of, of coral sex. Um, coral sex is a rare and amazing sight. On the Great Barrier Reef, it takes place once a year in November or December, shortly after a full moon. 
During the event called a mass spawning, billions of polyps, and a polyp is just an individual coral, uh, release in synchrony tiny bead-like bundles. These bundles, which contain both sperm and eggs, float to the surface and break apart. Most of the gametes become fish food or simply drift away. The lucky ones meet a gamete of the opposite sex and produce a coral embryo. Tank-raised corals will, if kept under the right conditions, spawn and sink with their relatives out in the ocean. For Van Oppen's team, and these are Ruth Gates' colleagues in, in Australia, the spawning offered a critical opportunity to nudge evolution along. The plan was to catch the captive corals in the act, scoop up the gamete bundles, and then a bit like pigeon fanciers, pick and choose the couplings. One team was hoping to breed Acropora ten tenuous, which is a very common species on the reef, uh, that were collected from warmer, the warmer northern part of the, the reef <clears throat> with corals collected from the south. A second team had plans to cross altogether different species of Acropora to create hybrids. Some of these offspring of these unnatural hookups would, so the thinking went, be more resilient than their parents. That evening, the researchers spent hours hovering over the tanks. This is going to be the big night, one of the scientists who is standing watch told me, I can feel it. In the run up to spawning, each polyp develops a tiny bump, making it seem as if the colony has goose pimples. This is called setting. As we looked on, a few of the colonies set. Then, perhaps out of modesty, perhaps out of anxiety, they held back. Gradually, people gave up and started to drift off to bed. The sea sim, this was that this lab that I was at, it's called the sea sim or the later the sea sim, has dorms for just such late nights. But these were full, so I headed out to the parking lot for the drive back to Townsville. Making my way through the dark, I could hear the fruit bats screeching in the trees. The following night, I was assured would be the big one. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that with us. It turns out it wasn't, didn't work out quite that way. It took a little bit longer, as I recall, right? Yeah, it took, it took, uh, we, we didn't get anything till the third night, but the third night was the big night. <laughs> so it finally did happen, actually. <laughs> um, Elizabeth, you said of the Great Barrier Reef that, and I'm quoting here, if there is a more spectacular place on earth or collection of places that you are unaware of it. Um, for those of us who have never been, and I know you, you, you talked about the sheer size of it, but for those of us who have never seen it with our own eyes, how would you describe it? Well, it's really, um, you know, to really appreciate the Great Barrier Reef. And as I said before, unfortunately, I'm not a diver, but to really get the full experience to the Great Barrier Reef, I think you do have to dive. I myself have, have only snorkeled on it. Um, but it is, you know, if you've ever, it, the sad thing is you feel like, you know, you feel like you're in the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau. You can only uh, compare it to those amazing nature documentaries that you've seen the shapes and the colors of a healthy reef where there are, you know, fish of these fantastically beautiful uh, colors racing by, uh, huge turtles, uh, rays, <clears throat> and the corals themselves grow and have, they, they have the, one of the really interesting things about corals is that they have living in their, inside them, these little tiny symbiotic plants and they give them, the plants give them these amazing colors. So they have a sort of, they can be purple, they can be pink, they can be yellow. Um, so it's an incredibly colorful, dynamic world, and you really feel like you've sort of fallen through the fabric, you know, of the world into a, a magical kingdom, really. It's, it's a spectacular experience. Wow. So your travels took you to Iceland uh, at one point, and you were visiting a company that, if I understand it correctly, they're working on capturing carbon dioxide and then turning it to stone to reduce global warming. Can you talk about how they're doing that and, and whether it works in any meaningful sort of way? Sure. So, so the project I went to in um, Iceland is, is run by a, a Swiss firm called Climeworks, where they're really trying, where they're trying to, you know, scale up this idea of, it was, it's either you could call it, you know, carbon dioxide removal, direct air capture, it has a lot of different names. And the thinking behind, you know, 
this is where we've already loaded up the atmosphere with unfortunately too much carbon. Uh, there's already too much carbon up there. And you know, every day we put up more. And what they were doing at, at, in Iceland is they were, they basically had these machines that look like, they look like giant air conditioning units um, and they have fans, sort of the ambient air runs through them. And the, there are chemicals in there that absorb CO2, they basically bind with CO2. And so the CO2 gets you know, sucked out of the air uh, and then it gets heated up, this whole unit gets heated up and the CO2 gets forced off, forced out of solution and gets collected in these sort of balloon-like things. Um, and then that process cycles over and over again. And what they do with the CO2 in, in Iceland, and one of the big questions with carbon dioxide removal is what are you gonna do with all that CO2? What they do with it there is they force it underground, pipe it underground, deep underground, mile underground, uh, where it combines, it actually reacts with their volcanic rock in Iceland to form uh, calcium, the compound calcium carbonate. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really interesting project. The question, you know, which I think I heard in your question of can we scale that up to make a meaningful, you know, difference? It's, it's tough, you know, because we are, everything we do, you know, is producing CO2. Every time we drive somewhere, every time we fly somewhere, every time uh, many of us heat our homes, it produces CO2. Most of us turn on the air conditioner. Uh, we're creating, we're, we're generating and emitting CO2. And so the scale of the problem, you know, the scale of the solution has to be commensurate with the scale of the problem. How's that? So the significance of the title of the book, uh, Under a White Sky, really doesn't come up until kind of toward the end of the book. And you're writing about solar geoengineering as an effort to offset uh, carbon dioxide levels. Can you, can you talk about that effort and how that played into the title of the book? Sure. So I, while I was reporting the book, and this is, this is the last chapter, you know, as we, we sort of run through, you know, things that are happening or very much in the, in the design phase. And then the book comes a little bit more out there. How's that? We'll use the word out there. Um, and the last chapter, for the last chapter, I spent a bunch of time with a, a group of scientists at Harvard who runs something called the Harvard Solar Geoengineering Research Program. And the idea behind solar geoengineering is that you know we've, we've already poured a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere, many, many hundreds of billions of tons it's warming the earth, CO2 traps heat, you know, that's global warming, that's pretty basic at this point. Um, and it's the, one of the many, one of the most daunting things about trying to deal with climate change is that CO2 is not like a lot of other pollutants. And when you put it up there, it stays up there for a long time. It's very hard if you get a climate you don't like, you decide, oh, this, this much warming, we, we, we don't like it, we can't live with it. It's very hard to do anything about it um, besides trying to suck a lot of carbon out of the air again. Or alternatively, this idea of solar geoengineering, which is that you would uh, counteract you know, one kind of mucking around with the atmosphere with another kind, where you would shoot some kind of compound into the stratosphere that would then reflect sunlight back to space, you'd create this sort of stratospheric haze, which is what happens when we get volcanic eruptions. There's a lot of sulfur dioxide that gets lofted into the stratosphere. It drifts around the whole world, creates this sort of haze and cools the world temporarily until those particles fall to earth. And so the idea is sort of, could you create fake volcanoes, you know, shoot this stuff out of planes is basically the idea. Uh, and that could you in that way counteract the effects, or at least partially counteract some of the effects of all the CO2 we've dumped into the air. And one of the, it's an extremely controversial proposal, idea, theory, um, but one of the many, many potential side effects of doing this would be to alter the appearance of the sky. So the sky would appear whiter. And that's a, that's the source of the title, Under a White Sky. Yeah. Elizabeth, one more question for you before we get to our audience questions. Your work has taken you all over the world, and this may be a difficult quest question to answer, but I'm wondering of all of the things that you have seen, if you had to identify one 
problem, one solution, or perhaps just one situation that really stands out in your mind that you spend a lot of time thinking about, what would that be? Well, I do think that the fate of reefs is up there. Um, you know, I feel very fortunate to have been to the Great Barrier Reef um, and seen it, you know, and people would say already, I did not see it, you know, in its, in its heyday, I, I already saw a diminished reef. Um, but people who are watching the reef change really, really fast. And, and this is true, not just the Great Barrier Reef, but the Caribbean reefs, um, the reefs in the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean all over people are seeing reefs being devastated. Um, and they are crucial, you know, they're crucial for, for a lot of reasons. They're crucial for a lot of people, you know, who make their living fishing on reefs and they're crucial for protecting coastal, a lot of coastal communities and they're crucial for marine life. Um, so the question of, of what are we going to do? Is there anything we can do uh, to get reefs through a, what is going to be a really difficult century for them until maybe you know we figure out you know maybe we do stop emitting CO2 and maybe we do eventually um, you know start bringing down even bringing down CO2 levels maybe through some form of carbon dioxide removal um, you know how are we going to get reefs, reefs through a really 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 tough time and that I think is is a is a huge and important question that. Um, you know, the answers that people have come up with or the theories they've, the, so that are floated, you know, it's unclear. It's really unclear what's going to happen, but it's a big, big major issue, it seems to me, that we really need to be focusing a lot of thought and a lot of resources on. Certainly. Um, lots of questions from our audience. So well, let's dive in with those. There's one here from Karen who says, I'm a mom of young kids and live with a dread for their future in a world with ecological collapse. What major life choices can make a difference? Well, this is you know, a great question and it's sort of the great question of our time. And you know, I think that in, in one's own personal life, you know, where does, where is one, having the biggest impact as an American, um, partly through how we get around, you know, our cars. Um, there's a lot of talk of electrifying our cars. Um, buying an electric car is, is probably a good step forward. Um, not using a car at all would be a good step forward. Um, how we, you know, how we get our electricity is huge. Um, trying to buy, purchase, or put up solar panels, um, purchase renewable energy. Those are those are some of the the biggies. Um, uh, flying less. Flying is a huge source of carbon emissions. I'm very guilty of flying. Um, I'm afraid. Um, so those are those are some of the big life choices that you can make. But you know, I think that anyone who looks at this issue, eating, you know, there are food choices do have an impact. I, I think that sometimes that impact's exaggerated, um, but, you know, eating less, less meat is definitely a, a climate friendly thing to do. Um, but I, you do, we do come back to the political system and it's good to talk to people in, you know, a swing state um, where, you know, we have to make pretty major systemic changes uh, and those require political action. It's going to be, if we're relying on everyone to do it on their own, you know, to be honest, it's just not, it's just not happening. So I think it's very worth making these choices to show your neighbors and your friends, look, this can be done. It, it's not, you know, life threatening, <laughs> um, but the big choices, the big changes also require political buy-in from, you know, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, Sophia asks, do you think there is still value in traditional science slash, slash research to address climate change? Or do you think more focus should be put on policy and more immediate conservation efforts because climate change is such a time sensitive issue? Well, I definitely think, you know, that any climate scientist would tell you um, you know, and I have a kid studying climate science, so I'm, <laughs> I have an interesting relationship to that. Um, 
But any climate scientist would tell you, look, we certainly know enough to act. We certainly know enough to know this is a, a big problem coming at us, you know, like a freight train. Um, and we could spend the next century trying to perfect our knowledge and our ability to, to predict exactly how this is gonna play out. Um, but we can tell you already, it's going to have huge consequences, uh, you know, up and down, you know, just, just to name one, you know, sea level rise, we, we just know that's coming at us uh, because, you know, warmer water just takes up more space. Uh, than cold water. Um, so we know sea level rise is a huge issue. So we know that there are a lot of impacts coming at us and we should be acting uh, both to reduce our emissions, to try to minimize how much damage we do, but also to get prepared, to prepare ourselves and our major cities and, and our agricultural systems for what we are already quite confident we're gonna be seeing. A question from Mark that uh, echoes one of the points you made just a few minutes ago. It says, given the scales involved, do these technological solutions offer a viable answer without a major shift in our political systems and popular support for climate change initiatives? Well, I think that we all, you know, for, for any form of, of action to make a difference. So, you know, there are, there are technological uh, measures, I mean, even reducing emissions, you know, even when we say, well, we really need to radically reduce our emissions, which we, which we absolutely do, we're still looking at huge technological change, right? We're looking at changing out our energy systems. Um, so everything has to be done to make a difference, you know, at huge scale, at global scale, unfortunately, you know, that gets us into another issue. You know, there's, there's the US scale, which is huge. And then there's a the global scale, which is even huger. So all of these, yeah, nothing can be done. Um, you know, the one potential, you know, techno fix, and that's sort of why it's in the book that people talk about, well, it could be done even, you know, by a very aggressive, you know, billionaire <laughs> potentially. Uh, solar geoengineering, um, I, I don't, I think that's an exaggerated danger, how's that? But um, everything requires massive, almost everything requires, you know, change on a, on a very massive scale. Yeah. Question from Joseph, kind of a tricky subject. Uh, he says, I don't read much about population control these days. Is this still a subject that is discussed in the environmental community? Well, I think that, you know, the, the sum total of, of, of human impacts on the planet are, um, have, have two major components. You know, one is uh, how, many, how many of us there are, how many people there are, and the second is how much we consume. And, you know, one of the interesting developments or of the last, you know, half a century or so is that, birth rates in, in, in developed countries, richer countries have gone down very, very pretty dramatically. And some, you know, there are a lot of European countries that aren't at replacement even anymore where their population is actually declining. Um, population is continuing to grow in, in some developing countries and poorer parts of the world. So, you know, population is, is a significant issue, I think, but I think the general sense is, you know, owing to what's, to these sort of demographic shifts, um, our, our population, the human population will sort of max out the century it should, and then start to decline. And the question of how we get through the century, we, we are at almost 8 billion people. We have to try to grapple with some of these problems with the population of the 8 billion people. So even, you know, if we, Put a lot of effort and money and i think the biden administration will start putting more effort and money into funding of uh, you know that at least that every woman on the planet who wants to be using you know birth control should have access to it and this is a american you know political football that 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 keeps um every administration changes changes the policy about our aid to, toward global population control efforts um, but, you know, even so, you know, we, we have to try to deal with the problems that we have with the population that we have. Um, 
And so, you know, that, that's where we're at. Question from Pamela, who says, what policy change priorities would you recommend for those of us who are eager to work at the federal and state policy level? Well, that is a, that is a really good question. And I think what we need is, you know, an, Fortunately, I think, and you know, there are a lot of people thinking about this, and I, I, I really do want to say that that someone who really wants to work on federal and state policy, you know, there are there are people who are a lot more expert on, than I am um, that should be consulted on this. How's that? But you need a combination of, you know, carrots and sticks. You need incentives uh, to change. So people talk. People often come back to this. Um, idea, I'll call it an idea, of putting a price on carbon. You know, you can't just dump carbon into the atmosphere for mm -hmm. free. <laughs> if you can, then, you know, a lot of forms of um, fossil fuel consumption are sort of being subsidized, as it were. Uh, and so we have to kind of try to level the playing field. Now, a good thing is that a lot of forms of renewable energy, or not a lot of forms, but solar energy, wind energy, have come down a lot in price. But if we want to really scale those up, and we keep getting back to these questions of scale, you're going to have to really scale those up, and they're going to have to compete, you know, price-wise with some of these really old fossil fuel power plants. And um, the best way to move that process along, I think, a lot of policymakers would say, would be to make it more expensive to burn fossil fuels. That would give these other technologies a big boost, um, and we'll see that has proved a real political uh, non-starter, has that in, in Washington, but maybe that is changing as well. Yeah. Um, interesting question from Sabrina who says, have you seen a technological solution that you feel confident will not have unintended consequences? <laughs> Wow, have I seen any solution that I feel confident, technological or untechnological? I mean, I think one of the things that we, you know, have to be mindful of even because we're talking about doing in doing things at such huge scale so for example you know there's a lot of talk about you know nature-based solutions so for example if we want to suck co2 out of the air we should use trees we should plant you know billions of trees and trees take up co2 as they grow um, they give it back again you know, when they rot, but while they're growing, they, 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 they take up a lot of CO2. And even that, which is, is, you know, sort of a natural solution when you, when you think about it, you know, if, if humans plant a lot of fast growing trees and sort of tree plantations and over many, many millions of acres, that's not really nature, you know, that has huge implications too. Um, so everything that you do at scale, um, to sort of match the scale of the of our previous interventions is going to have impacts. Um, some of them you can foresee and some of them you probably can't. Uh, and I think that's sort of one of the themes of the of the book, you know, at the end of the day is we are we are in the situation where none of the answers are great. There are no answers of, of just, oh, you know, we all live happily ever after and um, all of the choices are hard. We have to try, the best we can do is to try to anticipate as best as possible, choose, choose the best of, of, of some not great options. Yeah. Uh, Sophia has a question that says, I'm a student going into the science field and would love to write nonfiction about science. I was wondering what your path to being an author was like, specifically a scientific slash nature author. Well, I'm... I have to confess that I, my own science education is, is very limited. I studied, you know, I studied literature in college um, and I came to writing about environmental slash scientific issues in a, in a very roundabout sort of way. But I'm, I'm a reporter and so I approach it, you know, in some ways my lack of a scientific training I like to think, I sometimes like to think, <laughs> has its advantages because I sort of force people to explain things to me over and over again until I understand them. And then I try to present that to a, a, a general audience that probably also, you know, that I'm assuming also doesn't have that much of a science background. 
so I did, wouldn't say that a science background, you know, is essential for writing about science. You have to just uh, be a nudge and, you know, get people um, to explain things to you very carefully. Now, having a science background might, you know, be a tremendous advantage in that. And there are a lot of scientists out there who are great writers or, or good writers and have written, you know, really, really important books and great books about their subject. And that's a different way, obviously, at getting at science writing. Um, and, and I think there's been, you know, I think both that there are a lot of popular science books by journalists, and there is also a lot of great popular science books by scientists. Christina says, there is a lot to be sad about and being an environmental scientist or advocate can be difficult. Do you have any recommendations for self-care? <laughs> well, this is a tough one. Get, get out into the world. Yeah, and that's a hard one in, 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 in COVID times, but um, I think that, you know, I think it's, it's Gretel Ehrlich, the author, you know, the solace of open places. I mean, that, that one of the reasons, precisely the reason that a lot of these issues are so heavy and so sad is because, you know, of, of, of the destruction or the, the diminution, I guess, of, of places and that, and landscapes and the creatures in them that, that we value. Um, and I think that, I guess my only advice could be, well, uh, there's still a lot left, um, to to love and that it's important to get get out there and 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 experience that i think that that is is consoling yeah. for me at least how's that question from uh steven who says if global warming was moving at an extremely slow pace would our planet be able to evolve and adapt to the change well that's a really good question. These are all really good questions. I mean, we have, you know, sort of one of the climate change, you know, denier arguments always is, well, the climate has changed in the past, you know, and, and that's true. The climate has changed in the past. Um, in general, for the last many millions of years, we've been in sort of a, a cooling trend, um, but the world has been warmer than it is now uh, in, in, in the geological history. And I think that most evolutionary biologists would say to you, rate really matters when it comes to, you know, when you think about it, um, you know, we as humans, the reasons that, precisely the reason that we have such a, you know, tremendous impact on planet earth is you know, not just that there are a lot of us, although that's a big part of it, but also that we, we change our technologies. We're constantly changing things, you know, and that, uh, we don't have to evolve to change the whole world. If you have to evolve to keep up, right? That's a slow process. That's the, the process of, you know, trial and error of, of genetics. Um, and that tends to take quite a long time, especially if you're a slow reproducing creature, which is why a lot of big animals and slow to reproduce animals are in such bad shape. So yes, if this process were happening much more slowly, you know, orders of magnitude more slowly, it would be a lot less worrisome. And uh, we'll, we'll wrap with this question. Uh, Sophia says, reading your previous book, learning about the past five mass extinctions gave me a sense of scale and perspective and a strange sense of calm about our current situation. How do you stay motivated and optimistic about the world we live in when we're doing so much harm to the natural world? Well, I think, I think that's a really interesting response and I, I kind of agree with it. There was something cathartic for me about writing that book, The Sixth Extinction. Um, but I think that, you know, what, what keeps me going and keeps me working and writing on these issues is, is a sense a, of how, you know, just bloody important they are, how's that? <laughs> and B, how interesting the world is. I mean, the world is just really, really interesting. And even um, in our, you know, destructive capacities, the world remains really interesting. And the ideas that people have for how to try to ameliorate things are really interesting. So part of it is just 
it's just wow and you know there's that there's that sort of curse or whatever it's a sort of apocryphal i guess but you know may you live in interesting times and we do live in interesting times and 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 i guess the only advice i can 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 give to folks is yeah it's it's really interesting and um sure it can be very depressing but we also have to appreciate how how incredibly endlessly fascinating it is and that's i guess what keeps me going as a journalist yeah well and speaking of that elizabeth there actually is one more question that goes to that and and then we'll will be done. But Mark says, given all that you've written about climate change and witnessing so much firsthand, do you feel compelled to continue writing about it? Does it now feel like an ethical imperative to devote yourself to it? <laughs> that is such a good question. I, I've just been thinking about that. Um, you know, yes, I suppose yes. I suppose the answer is yes. And one of the problems with being a journalist is, you know, you have to say something new. You can't just write the same thing. Your editors don't like it when you just write the same thing over and over again. Um, so I have to decide, do I have something new to say on these issues? Yeah. And that's, that was, this book is my attempt to do that as that, but going forward, uh, I, I kind of need to think about that one. Well, I, I suspect I speak for all of us when I say we certainly hope that you will continue to write about these issues because you've helped all of us, I think, to gain a much better understanding of the magnitude of the problems that we're facing and some of the attempts at solutions and sort of where we all are in all of this. So thank you so much, Elizabeth, for this wonderful book and also for taking the time uh, to talk us through all of this tonight. Well, thank you, Tracy, and thanks everyone for, for coming out as it were. I don't know what one says to Zoom, but for, 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 being, for being here, I really, really appreciate it. Yes, many thanks to all of you for joining us. I wanna say a special thank you to the uh, author events team at the Free Library of Philadelphia, to Andy Cahan, to uh, Elizabeth Richard, who introduced us tonight, to uh, Laura and Jason and all the gang at the library. Thank you all so much for all the work that you do. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you next time. Good night, everyone, stay safe.